Football on Off The Ball With Sky Watch every single live Premier League game On Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports Hey, you're very welcome back to OTB Saturday here on News Talk. Shane Hannan with you through until 5 o'clock p.m. this evening. And for John Duggan, we've got uh, OTB Football Saturday now as well and Football and Off the Ball brought to you by Sky. All the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports. We've got all the build-up now to uh, what is uh, a huge clash, 5 o'clock, Azerbaijan versus the Republic of Ireland in Baku. Really, really must win for Stephen Kenny, you would imagine, at this stage. Uh, we have Johnny Ward in the studio. Good afternoon, Johnny. Really building it up there, this dead rubber. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's funny. Like you, you mentioned Sky there, and you know Sky's kind of ability to hide the Premier League is is is, is unbelievable. But um, it's a weird game. It means nothing, but it means everything. It's it's just so weird. It's like anyone looking at um the, the newspapers, Gazette della Sport, whatever, will see this dead rubber game and think nothing of it. But it's kind of all we've been talking about all week, to be honest, and hopefully all we'll be talking about afterwards as well. Yeah, for sure. We need a result big time. We'll get into that game uh, very shortly. We'll have uh, Kevin Doyle after four o'clock. Uh, we have Dan McDonnell, who's going to be over in Baku for us as well. And we'll say hello to Stephen O'Donnell in just a second. We're, uh, we're live on stream as well, youtube.com forward slash off the ball and Facebook and on Twitter as well at off the ball. So you can get your comments into us. Text us at 53106 what your predictions are for this evening's game. A huge one, it has to be said. And uh, good afternoon to the St. Pat's manager, Stephen O'Donnell. Stephen, how are you? Not bad. How are you keeping? Keeping well, keeping well. It's a, it's a nervy one. We'll touch on that game in, in just a second. I just wanted to start, um, I guess, just to bookend this story, Johnny, from, from the week. The uh, the Newcastle takeover by the Saudis. Um, and it's something that I guess has left uh, a sore taste in the mouth for a lot of football fans, Newcastle fans. You saw them dancing and celebrating on the streets. Quite happy. Um, and we've heard these legally binding assurances that the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will not be running the football club. Um, take Make of that what you will, I guess. But um, it's a strange one. Uh, a country with an appalling human rights record, it has to be said. Uh, Newcastle fans clearly delighted. It's going to bring a serious cash injection, but leaves a bad taste in the mouth. That's... It's it's horrible, really, and I suppose I should I should mention the fact that you know my own club, Go United, were linked with a, a takeover by uh, Saudi investors a few years ago, um, and I was had to reflect on this coming into the show today because uh, eighty percent or so of Go United fans voted in favour of the Saudi takeover, and I was one of them, um, on the basis that Go United really had no assets, and um, so if the Saudi thing went badly. Um, I didn't think they'd leave it in any more, um, any worse of a state than it could be. And there was a lot of talk of investment and putting money into the grassroots and so on and so forth. It all fell apart to this day. I don't really know why, but it fell apart. So I should I should mention that. But, um, you know, I don't think anyone could deny that there are clear links to the Saudi regime in this takeover. Um, the fact that Newcastle fans are celebrating it is, I think it's quite sad, to be honest. Um and, you know, sport is ultimately a trivial matter, but there's nothing trivial about um, being locked in a Saudi jail or being a journalist who has basically gone in for a visa um, in Istanbul and ends up dismembered, um, something the Saudis denied but clearly did. Um, it's a horrible regime, and um, I think, you know, football fans definitely need to have a, a hard look at themselves. Mike Ashley may have been many things, but um, he wasn't a Saudi government. Um, it's quite sad. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a strange one uh, to say the very least. You've literally read the book on Mohammed bin Salman, Johnny. It has to be said. Yeah, it's just just throw that out there that uh, you know we do read from time to time. Um, <laughs> I think we should read more. To be honest, I think we're probably on our phones a bit too much. Um, but um, the Saudi, the whole Saudi system, Shane, is just unbelievable. Like there was one particular king, um, and he was considered like a fairly um, not 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 the most ostentatious of the royal family who just literally donated all his kids and Saudi men can have lots of kids he just donated them all a billion each and just said listen go ahead and do what you want and that's that's how much money they have over there and um, Mohammed bin Salman is obviously the latest um kind of I suppose line in the throne he's a young very aggressive um very um, kind of he would like to think of him as himself as modern thinking and in fairness he has made some reforms in Saudi um, but this is all part this is sport watching there's, there's no getting away from it um, and it's it's a sad state of affairs that you will have Newcastle fans who will be kind of debating the trivial matters of um, you know the next signing or the the, 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 the the potential improvement post Mike Ashley and will probably think little of proxy wars in Yemen and so on 
Yeah, uh, like I saw the, 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 the pictures on Sky, Stephen, during the week and you see one kid being asked, who, who do you want your club to sign now? And he says Mbappe. And this, this is the reality of it. Fans are kind of getting carried, caught up and carried away, understandably in some ways. Uh, one guy saying you know, it's the best day for the club since they won the Ferris Cup back in 1969. Um, one guy even said it was, a, it was a better day than his kid being born, which I thought was uh, quite hilarious. But it, it, it's, it's an awkward one, Stephen, because you can understand the fans' excitement. A cash injection into the club like that is going to be huge for them. But you can't ignore where the money has come from. Yeah, exactly. Look, I don't. I'm totally ignorant. I wouldn't be, wouldn't be up to date enough in, in politics, etc. Like Johnny to 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 know the ins and outs. But like in life in general, I think people are only well. The majority of people are only concerned about, you know, what's relevant to them. It's the same with I suppose starvation all around the world and us living in our own little bubble in Ireland. And it affects us, obviously some in Ireland, but not the generalisation. And people don't give a second thought to them type of countries and to you know, all different sort of, I suppose, um, political stuff that's going on in the world. Everyone's just whatever concerns them or, or whatever is relevant to them in their lives. And look at the Newcastle fans. All they're looking at is the small picture as in, you know, our club has lots and lots of money now and we're going to, we've had a few years of torment of maybe going down the championship and back up. And then when they're in the Premier League, they're, they've obviously been struggling a little bit and it's sort of drab to watch they're now seeing we can sign the best players in the world and we we have the richest owners richest owners in the world and you know that's all I think they're probably concerned about well the majority are of, of getting an exciting football team and seeing major superstars coming to St James's Park Would you have any sympathy like for Steve Bruce I know he's approaching I think his 1000th game in management at uh, probably a bad time um, everyone really calling for his head fans, fans wise like it's awkward for a manager like that, but then I guess you can't have too much sympathy, Stephen, because he's going to undoubtedly get a, a huge payoff. Yeah, look, you have sympathy, especially now, um, you obviously, to to the management, the coaching side of it, you, you'd know, obviously, the pressure and um, magnified by by, by hum- humongous uh, degree in regards to Premier League. You can't do anything. Prep managers are under such scrutiny and that, so you, you obviously you, you feel for him a little bit, but... He's um he's, I think he came out with a statement and said he he loves manage and he'd lo- like to stay on but he's realistic too so I think you know any manager that gets the, I think 999 games <laughs> has had a really successful career in the game and he's had lots of different clubs and managed different clubs in the Premier League so as a manager he's been very successful but I think he's he's been realistic too in the sense that obviously the new owners I suppose will want will want to change the management and bring their own stamp to it. I just want to bring you a clip from uh, from Kenny Cunningham from uh, during the week. So Kenny was speaking uh, to the lads um, on OTBAM, I think it was, during the week, and he was giving his own thoughts on, on the new Newcastle ownership. Have a listen. No part of you is a little bit put off by the source of the money? Oh, it, it is. Yeah, you've mentioned it there. It does stick in the gut. I, I'd have to admit that, and it'd be nice. Look, we've met, I've mentioned before about the fans and the club, and I'm delighted for them. That's... That's absolutely the case, but I think you can park that uh, to the side. But there's that, there is that kind of uh, elephant in the room, and I think it's important it gets it gets kind of referenced. You can talk about generally that kind of uh, the the country itself and kind of how they operate and how they treat their citizens, maybe women in particular. But I think if any kind of anything kind of encapsulates uh, the issues in in regards to how the country is run, it was the it was the murder of that uh, Saudi journalist in. In the Saudi embassy in in Turkey, I mean that was a pretty despicable, disgusting uh, act, and I think that needs to, uh, to be referenced. Like you know, it, um, I think every if anybody who's read it, and I'd be the same as anybody else, a layman just picking up the paper, and I've read as much as anybody else, but pretty kind of sickening uh, 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 what happened there in terms of how that man was lured into the uh, embassy under false pretenses and treated the way he was. So I have a huge amount of sympathy for his family as. I think it was his fiance at the time. He was actually going there, wasn't he, to get papers so he could actually marry his fiance at the time. And she's walking around. She's obviously trying to fight his case, and you hear uh, quotes for her obviously trying to keep the case in the in the public on the spotlight. But not too many people, I don't think, are interested in listening. And we won't hear too much of it over the coming weeks in relation to the Newcastle story. But I think it's important that it is kind of referenced, and it's not. It's uh, you know, people are made aware of it. And I think it'd be nice to see some kind of acknowledgement somewhere, whether it's the Premier League or or somewhere else. 
Yeah, Kenny Cunningham there speaking to uh, Adrian and Owen on O2 AM during the week about this Saudi takeover of Newcastle. It's a, it's an awkward one, Johnny. And I know Amanda Stavely was talking um, about you know a Premier League win, hopes for a Premier League title win in between five and ten years for them. I know Newcastle fans have had 14 horrible years under Mike Ashley, so in one way you can understand why they're excited to move on to something else. But uh, an awkward one for the fans because, I mean, why wouldn't they celebrate in their minds? But it's it's kind of finger, finger in the ears kind of job and forget the, the where the money come, came from, essentially. Yeah, and... Do you know, you, like you can look at other clubs. Like I've always wondered. Like I don't, I don't really know Man City fans, but I do wonder. Like the old school Man City fans who went to Main Road and watched the team perennially finish wherever mid table and be in the, in the shadow of Manchester United. Like, did they care the way that you know success was effectively bought under Pep Guardiola? Did they care where the money come came from? Maybe a lot of them didn't. Um, an interesting point of it as well about the, the the Saudi the Saudi government and when when it go, comes away from the Kasaji stuff and their surveillance. Um, when I was on Twitter, I remember tweeting about the Saudi Cup, which is the richest horse race in the world, and it has a prize fund of twenty million dollars. And I just made the point that like it's pretty obscene that horses are racing for twenty million dollars whilst over the border in Yemen, kids are starving you know, partly because of the Saudis' involvement in that war. And I got a scatter of responses from supposedly, like, a- average Joes um, called Mohammed or whatever else who were just backing the Saudi regime. They were all paid for by the government. So they have, like, all that stuff where if there's criticism of the Saudi regime on Twitter now in terms of this takeover, it'd be interesting to scan the responses because um, the government has its own sort of surveillance um, committee type thing. A lot of people are paid online to to basically to counter any anti Saudi stuff and um that'll be a feature in this as well. It's it's really murky and um I would hope Newcastle fans would would bear in mind that a football match is a football match. There's a lot more to life than that. Yeah, that's a fair point. Absolutely. You know it's a it's a strange one, this Newcastle takeover by by, by the Saudis and uh, look their their next game is at home to Tottenham on, on Sunday the seventeenth of October, half past four. We'll we'll keep a close eye on that game to see the reaction uh, of the fans and certainly to see if Steve Bruce is still in with a job to see if he gets that 1,000th game in charge John you had, a, you had an interesting point that we were chatting uh, uh, before the show started about the lack of Irish managers in the Premier League and, and in leagues generally in England and it's a fair point yeah so like the, the game today now is obviously we can go to Stephen on this but the game today we'll be reliant on um, you know League 1 type players um, or, or players who are not playing for, for Premier League clubs um, to score for us and so on and obviously the Stephen Kenny is almost more likely to be at a championship game or a League 1 game than a Premier League game but something I think that is quite staggering Stephen considering that there's been such a close link between the two countries countries it's effectively bar Mick McCarthy who himself is you know he's effectively a northern Englishman in, in, in the way he was brought up in the game and that he's a Barnsley native and so forth I don't think there's a single manager from the Republic of Ireland managing in the four leagues now and for the likes of you and young managers in Ireland who have aspirations to be whatever you want to be is it something you think about or I know Stephen Kenny or Stephen um, Bradley was linked with MK Dons but it just doesn't seem to be a passage there anymore yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I never really gave a second thought to it until you, you actually said it. And now that you make the point, I'm racking my brains. Um, and uh, there is a dearth of, obviously, Irish managers across the way. But um, I've not had any deep thought into it. You know, you, you, when you become a coach or whatever, you, you're so busy in your own little bubble in regards to the League of Ireland and trying to get your team as set up as properly and, and be as successful as they can you know whatever will be will be in football that's my attitude just work your hardest every day and see where that takes you but um, I've never really thought of it but it is an interest. it is an interesting point and it probably you know the lower leagues you would think you know obviously the top top flight in the Premier League it's it's following a pattern of probably our players not having loads and loads of Irish players playing in the Premier League but definitely lower leagues it's interesting that no, no real first team managers in the lower leagues. Now I do know there's quite a few Irish coaches in academies, etc. Across mm. Channel and that, um, you know. But um, it's an interesting point, and I wouldn't really be able to put my finger on it. But you know, it might flip uh, some sort of cycles. You know, obviously you can see it now, even drip feeding into the championship, etc. With with lots of foreign managers, German, Spanish, Portuguese, etc. Getting championship managers jobs, which as before uh, before the the old first division and the championship really would have been totally british british based uh, in regards to management definitely but you can see more and more now foreign coaches are, are filtering down through obviously down through the premier division and now into the championship so it's obviously becoming the english game is 
is the richest probably country in regards to football, in regards to the richest there available down through the league. So it's attracting more and more more and more foreign coaches and obviously players. You can see the amount of foreigners now and playing championship, etc. as well as a lot lot more than it was previous. So I think the management and coaching is just following suit, really. And the, the, the link with Britain is definitely changing. Like, I know, you know, the, the whole Brexit thing, I don't think we really fully understand yet the repercussions. But, like, I know your, yourselves, you, you know, you let young um, Glory go to a, a, a club in, in France this Green. year. Yeah. And obviously, Kevin Zeffi's gone to Inter. Um, you know, a lot of Irish underage players now are, are coming from from European leagues. And when you when you th- the, the link is kind of being broken to an extent, isn't it? But we've no we've no Irish manager in, in in any of the four leagues from the south of Ireland, effectively, and we've very few players playing at the top level there now. Yeah, well, you know, previous I think people sort of forget the. They, they sort of go on about like the, the, the sort of lack of Ireland internationals playing Premier League football, but it's gone far, far more global, the yeah. Premier League, than it was 15, 20 years ago, you know, and you look into the 80s, it was really just Britain and Ireland that played in the in the top division and the old first division and that, so that's a follow-on, it's it's, it's far more, you know, it's it's more condensed, the, player, the, 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 the clubs are signing players from all around the globe now, rather than you know, maybe it was sort of Britain and a little bit Europe in the 90s, early 2000s. Now it's just gone global. So the competition to play in the Premier League is is is, is huge uh, as compared compared to what it was. So that's another reason. Not necessarily maybe the talent was better previous, but also the competition is is far more global than it was too to play in them teams. And um, the youngsters, obviously with Brexit, etc. I think you know, uh, they're, they're sort of European clubs are obviously taking a little bit more interest. Plus, I would say, you know, now we have Irish you know, Irish youngsters with their origin and maybe their background not being specifically to Ireland might might help in regards, um, you know, European countries and they might open up a little bit more avenues. And we're, we're obviously a lot more cosmopolitan than we were. They're Irish youngsters, but I think Kevin Zeffi might have... Uh, maybe Albanian connections and glory uh, in regards French etc so that's also maybe a little sort of um, a little thing that comes into it also you know there may be the families and that the origins are a little bit more varied than they were this is a boon for you as well, isn't it? Like, like you've brought in James Abanka this season, um, who's obviously another kid with that sort of mixed heritage or whatever. And, you know, from your perspective, you, and, and particularly Pat's a very strong underage, it must be seen like it's it's an, it's amazing how many of these kids are coming through and doing extremely well at sport, and it's to our benefit, obviously. Yeah, definitely. We have good youngsters, as you said. Um, and it, it's massively refreshing, I think, as well, you know, giving youngsters their head and... You know, throwing them in in their debuts and maybe seeing it how you know how they could be a little bit on edge, a little bit nervy in regards to training, etc. And then you're throwing them into the into the lines. Then their big massive occasions in their career and in their life and seeing them and seeing them flourish is huge. So it's very rewarding in regards to working with youngsters and giving them their head and maybe giving them their debuts because you're giving opportunities to young players that they'll, they'll remember that night or they'll remember their first team debut for life. So it's a, huge moment in their lives and in their career so it, it's hugely rewarding in that regard I wonder just on the <clears throat> the coaching uh, point Stephen like it's an interesting one someone in the text makes the point Brian Barry Murphy is involved in coaching he's no longer the manager of, of Rochdale of course but he's heading the, the Manchester City elite development squad but when you see people like Anthony Barry for example is from Liverpool he's brought in to you know help coach the Irish team unquestionably a, a, an excellent coach helped Chelsea win the Champions League um, you know you see other English coaches being brought in to, to do jobs here but there are positives as well John Walters is involved with Tom Owens under Irish under 19 squad uh, Keith Andrews of course is in Stephen Kenny's backroom team but then when you see the likes of you know Lee Carsley there for example Stephen uh, unquestionably a quality coach um, headhunted by the FA over in England like is he not someone the FAI should have absolutely made sure was involved in underage setups here? Is it an awkward thing? Is it just a case of some slip through the net, or are there pathways for for Irish coaches to get the big jobs? Well, it's opportunities as well. Lee Carsey, you know, the FA is a far far bigger association than the FAI, so there's far more full time jobs available. I think Lee Carsey was obviously before he got the under twenty one job. You know, he was full time with the FA. I'm not sure it might have been out of possession coach or defensive coach or something so it just shows you how specific and how much detail they're going into it so you know once they get on that ladder in regards to the FAI obviously uh, relations are built and then he gets the under 21 um, opportunity the under 21 job so 
it's um, it's opportunities too, and obviously English football. There's a lot more opportunities. Lee Carsey would have played obviously all his career in England in the Premier League and Championships. So there's far more opportunities in England to start off and get a full time job starting off when you finish your playing career than there is in Ireland. So you know that's that's a huge part of it also. The, wi- the wider debate as well, Shane, is the fact that um, and you know it was interesting that Mihal Martin's interview with with um, Joe Malloy was referenced by Gavin Comiskey today um, in, t- in the sense of Mihal Martin talked about the industry in this country the beauty of it is Stephen that if you have like under 13, 14, 15 17, 19 League of Ireland clubs they need coaches and the opportunities now you look at Tom Moan and Colin O'Brien what they're doing these are ex-League of Ireland players um, there, are, there are lots and lots of jobs and, and I mean jobs that should be fully paid jobs that will become available in this country and we can kind of make our own industry out of this rather than being reliant on our big neighbour Exactly. Well, I sort of, me personally speaking, I would have had that in regards, you know, obviously the pro license is required to be a manager in the League of Ireland. Um, You know, so in order for me, when I retired playing, you know, my options were maybe having to get a full-time job outside of football while I'd done my badges in regards. There's no real full-time underage jobs. You can't just go like you can in England. So retire from football want to go into coach and then you go into a full-time academy opportunity you know in, in one of the academies and all, all across England so it's um you're right we need to sort of obviously idealistic but you, we need to build our own industry here where you know we're always looking at the end product in regard to the Ireland senior team but no one sort of well people are starting to delve underneath now but you know you see I think little Gavira you saw him little Spanish 17 year old playing against Italy and how comfortable he was at 17 not the best athlete not the most mobile but how intelligent he was and how technically sound he was you know that's all from from coming up in La Masia up in an academy and there's no reason obviously we mightn't produce the numbers that they produce in regards top technical ability players but there's no reason why we can't produce our own as well but it comes from contact hours contact hours comes from coaching every day and coaching every day comes from full-time jobs for coaches so uh, at underage levels that when you are developing your technique at, at the really crucial period between in around maybe 8 and 14 so you know that's obviously something we have to get our own house in order and hopefully we do start because coming from where it was from when I was a youngster to the youngsters now um, it's night and day so there definitely is a huge improvement in that regard and there's so many people doing great work at underage level all across the country and you know it's just about adding to that on top of that and as you say creating our own football industry in this country I'm curious Stephen as well like you, you you got into management yourself obviously when you retired I think it's approaching three years now in January and, and straight into the uh, opposition scout analyst uh, job with, with Dundalk and then on to of course in Pats and, and the head coach manager's job there like that's You've had a couple of years in it now, and like, have you had any surprises? It's a different kind of pressure to being a player completely. But did any aspects of going into management surprise you? Were you, uh, I guess, as I said, it's a different kind of pressure, but you get used to it over the years. And I'm sure the first couple of years have been eye-opening for you. Yeah, definitely. Look, it's non-stop. Uh, there's far more responsibility too on the other side of the fence in regards. Uh, what you feel in, after a defeat a lot of time with the player you can sort of pinpoint your own performance and you get beat and maybe you might have played alright in a defeat that gives you a little bit of solace and you know you can do something about it the next week uh, whereas in, on, the, on the other side of the fence you feel a lot more responsibility uh, in regards when you lose losses are far far harder to take and it's just 24-7 the job is 24-7 it never, it never stops so if you're not at the training ground and you're not getting organised for tomorrow's training session or a tactical approach to to a future game. You're at home. You're always on the phone. You're always thinking about tomorrow's session or, or tomorrow's game. And um, you know it's non-stop. And um, the workload in regards the mental toll it takes in regard the amount of hours you spend thinking about obviously your own squad, your players individually, how they need managed and um, problem solving is huge. But on the flip side of that, when you do get a a positive result or a good victory, you know, um, it's a, it's a great feeling. So, when you were a player, you only had to mind your own little patch. You get your body in as best shape as possible. Look after your own performance. Whereas, obviously, our coaching staff, there's a full you're responsible for 
20, 22 players, you know, it's a it's a massive responsibility and you know, we're trying to give them the best platform they have to go and, and showcase their talents. Where do the ideas come from then, Stephen, as well, in terms of uh, of tactics and coaching in general? Like, do, do yourself and like the, the, the Dundalk manager or the Shamrock Rovers manager, do you watch Man City and Liverpool last week and think this is just a completely different sport? Or do you see things in that game, you know, that you think, well, actually, that's interesting what's happening here in terms of the evolution of the game? Or where do the ideas come from in Ireland? Of course you do, yeah. You, you rob, you know, the best learners are the ones that rob uh, ideas. You know, you're watching the top table the top of the tree you know like any profession you're going to go and watch the ones that are at the top of the tree in that profession and see if you can learn from them and and rob ideas from them obviously you'll have your own ideas also but you know the main thing football is is um you know it's about watching opposition watching the top teams watching the top managers and forming new ideas and seeing what, what ones might suit your suit your level you're, you're saying it might be a different game it's not. It's the exact same game. It's just played at a, at a technically faster pace and technically better level. But the whole ideology of the game is the exact same. It's just obviously them players are capable of doing it at, at a superior level. A superior level, but it's the same ideas. It, stri- it strikes me as when you're speaking there, Stephen, as well. You you talked about you know it's a twenty four seven job and not really having much time to. I guess do other things. It's a it's a really really full time uh, gig you've got there with Pats and and all the League of Ireland managers are the same. Like John Kiley, I remember John Kiley, the Limerick hurling manager, talking quite recently about uh, after the twenty eighteen All Ireland semi final, <clears throat> Limerick beat Cork in that absolute classic at Croke Park. He was so caught up in the emotion of it and the stress of it, I guess, that he had to take, you know, whether it was a few days or a week off and let the backroom t- team kind of step in and, and he just needed time to unwind and get away from it all because it was so intense. Like, I know football players have, have you know, sports psychologists now they can go to and people within the club they can go and speak to about stresses or pressure and that sort of thing. Like, for yourself as a manager, like, do you have similar, uh, I guess people you can go to in terms of, uh, I guess, club-provided people, or is it, is it fully, fully invested, or do you get time to kind of sit back and relax and, and look after your head as well? I don't know, like, it's each to their own, whatever floats uh, floats each other, a, per, a person's boat. Uh, even when you get positive results, at the, the um, that night you tend to hit a mid, little bit of a flat spot when you go home, obviously, the adrenaline and that you're still thinking about the game and because you're preparing probably all week and all day you know with our games being night games the whole day you're thinking about the game and even when the result is positive you do tend to hit a flat spot come around 11 half 11 when you're at home uh, in regards just from mental sort of being so tired mentally um, but also even when you get defeats um, you're living life on the edge one way or another, you know. So the game is is, is a massive adrenaline adrenaline kick during the game because obviously, as a coach of a team, you're invested in the game for ninety minutes. If the opposition are attacking, you're obviously hoping you're you're solid defensively. You're attacking. You're trying to be as creative as possible. So, and when you get a bad defeat and your back's against the wall, you're still on the edge in regards excitement of life and problem solving. So. In that regard, I wouldn't swap it for the world, even though obviously defeats are, you know, they're very hard to shake off over the coming weekend. And that I think Michelle, my wife, dreads not just obviously disappointed when we lose, but she, she's dreading the form that I'm going to come home in and, and spend the weekend in. But it is living on the edge in regards to the ad- adrenaline rush. And I think it's a good replacement for a player in the sense that it's the same thing. It's an adrenaline going out and performing in front of people. And then when you stop that, Obviously, coaching and management is is the closest thing to it. Um, but it does take a toll, and it's important that you get your your downtime away from football too, and try and switch off. But I think you'd be a bit of a fibber if you if you definitely say you totally switch off from it. I I don't I don't think actually you mentioned Michelle there. Um, I don't I don't think the wives and girlfriends of managers get anywhere near enough credit. I've just like and I've been in the company of managers at times when they'll you know they'll be at home with the with the kids, but they're you know it might be might be the transfer window or whatever it's just never off the phone and it's 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 um you know the, nobody really talks about that but the 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 partners like and I've spoken to managers who like we 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 spoke to Gary Cronin recently on our podcast and he was saying when Bray were having a bad run of results his daughter just came up to him one day and she said daddy what's wrong and he, you know he he just had to explain this i think they didn't win their first six games this season and it's hard like and i i think um 
I don't know, Stephen. I think they, they do... I'm not, I'm not saying you individually, but I do think the, the wives and the partners of, of managers, they have to put up with a lot and people don't see that. Without a doubt. Uh, without a doubt, I suppose, because... Sometimes managers or anyone involved in football can get can get caught up in that the the world revolves around them and it's all decided by the results on a Friday night and then they have carte blanche to be in whatever form they they, they want to be in regard in regarding the outcome of the results. So um, huge amount of sort of sacrifice, even you know from a, a family side of it, of being able to go to events and weddings and whatever it may be. Um, a lot of that is knocked on the head as well. So. The partners of of anybody involved in sport and in, in elite level sport or top level sport has to make massive sacrifices. As I said, you can get lulled into thinking it's all about you if you're a player or a coach or a manager. Whereas, you know, it's it's huge to have a balance, and obviously, they need to have their 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 life as well. And sometimes you can get so caught up in it that you only think the only thing important is is your job. Well, certainly one manager under uh, severe pressure today is Stephen Kenny. We might touch on, uh, we might get into the Republic of Ireland uh, build-up uh, just after this ad break and, and kind of bookend it there. But uh, get your get your thoughts into us if you're listening in today on the, on the match this evening. It's going to be a, an interesting game for Stephen Kenny and his players. Must win uh, has been the phrase bandied around all week. 53106 is the text number. You can get in touch as well on the stream as well. YouTube.com forward slash off the ball. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at off the ball. I mean, it's going to be a huge game. 300 or so Irish fans over in Baku as well. We'll have Dan McDonald joining us on the line from there. Uh, Kevin Doyle after four o'clock as well. But uh, get your thoughts into us and we'll be back with uh, plenty of build-up to Azerbaijan versus the Republic of Ireland after this quick break. Sports. Very welcome back to Off The Ball Saturday here on News Talk. Shane Hannan with you through until five o'clock. Plenty of build-up now between uh, now and five o'clock for the Azerbaijan versus Republic of Ireland game uh, a huge one for Stephen Kenny and his Irish team I just quickly uh, before we get into that bring you a couple of the other bits of news in the sporting world happening today <clears throat> it's not the only game in Ireland's group of course today Luxembourg taking on Serbia in the other game at 7.45pm uh, Northern Ireland face a crunch qualifier against Switzerland this evening a win for Ian Barclough's team would take them level on points with their opponents in the battle to finish second in Group C. Scotland will play at a full Hampden Park for the first time under manager Stephen Clark. Steve Clark when they face Israel and England are away to Andorra. In uh, rugby, Leinster have beaten Zebra by 43 points to seven in, at the ODS, that's in the United Rugby Championship. Adam Byrne went over the line twice for Leo Cullen's side after making his first start in almost two years. A, a happy return for him and for the Leinster fans, surely as well. Uh, Connacht will look to build on last week's win over the Bulls when they take on the Dragons at the sports ground at a quarter past five. Of course, big news in boxing tonight as well. Tyson Fury making the first defence of his WBC World Heavyweight Boxing title this evening. He'll face Deontay Wilder for a third time in Las Vegas later. Fury, of course, beat his American opponent with a technical knockout when the pair last fought 20 months ago. Uh, after four o'clock, we'll be joined by Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent in Baku. Kevin Doyle, the former Irish international striker, uh, will join us as well. At the moment, I'm joined in studio by Johnny Ward, the broadcaster and journalist, and uh, also on the line by the St. Patrick's Athletic Manager, Stephen O'Donnell. The Irish team is in, so the team news is in for the Azerbaijan game. John Egan, captain, uh, back three remaining unchanged from that draw with Serbia. We've got Daryl Horgan, Callum Robinson and Adam Ida all starting. Johnny, I'm just looking at this team now. So Gavin Bazunu in goals. I guess the back three, if we're going to say it's a 3-5-2. Shane Duffy, Captain John Egan and Andrew Omabamadeli. Matt Doherty, I assume, wide right. James McLean, wide left. Uh, in the middle, then you've got Josh Cullen, uh, Jeff Hendrick. Uh, Daryl Horgan could be utilised then maybe behind Adam Ida, is it? Or what, what's your take on this team? Yeah, what do you make of it, Stevie? I'm not sure now. I need to have a. I need to have a look at the shape. Who, who have we got? Have we missed one out there? We've got so Gavin Mizunu, Matt Doherty, Shane Duffy, John Egan, Josh Cullen, Callum Robinson, Adam Ida, James McLean, Jeff Hendrick, Daryl Horgan, Andrew Amabamadeli. So I've left left out Callum Robinson there. So I guess yes. Yeah, it's so Robinson up top. <clears throat> um, it could be, or else it could be kind of a three-four-three with Robinson wide right, maybe Daryl Horgan wide left of a top three either through the middle and then. Uh, Cullen Hendrick in the middle, and then your uh, Darty McLean on the sides. So I wouldn't. I'd say it's more that shape than maybe a three-five-two because yeah. I just can't see Daryl Horgan playing maybe in a in a midfield three. He could he might play ahead of 
of Cullen and um, Jeff Hendrick, but maybe it could be a three-four-three, maybe as well. You said you expected Kenny to kind of change formation a bit, Johnny. Maybe uh, today. I, I see. I don't know. Um, I'd be definitely interested in views in this CV because I, I don't think you know he wasn't. He was never a three at the back man, and I, I know it's an Anthony Barry thing, I guess, to some extent. But um, I thought it was more of a product of the fact that he didn't, he didn't have the wingers available, maybe that he wants to play Robinson and. Um, you know Chidozi Ogbeni as well um, so I don't know Stevie do you think he's going to persist with the three at the back I, I, I personally thought that um, in the game against Serbia I was at that game and I thought our wing backs were so exposed at times because they just had to double up constantly with overloads out wide because of the system but what do you make of it Stevie? Yeah well I think originally wasn't it that we started off with a back four but I think a lot of people were saying I think I remember Bulgaria away it was Enda Stevens and Matt Doherty played as our full backs and I think a lot of people were saying, obviously, they were playing their club football as wing-backs and they were maybe a little bit exposed. I think it was Egan and Duffy as the two centre-halves. So, um, over the course of time, obviously, obviously Stephen and his coach and staff have seemed to have settled on, on a back three. Um, very much like, as you said, a little bit similar Anthony Barry coming from Chelsea. Um, a lot of similarities. So, um, it seems to be the way he's going forward. Obviously, Stephen wouldn't have played really a back three ever. Uh, prior to that in his club career but looking from a, a point of view of um, I think the last two games from my point of view have been uh, two of the most entertaining games I've seen Ireland being involved in in the years granted people were saying we, we maybe rode our luck a little bit against Serbia which we did but at times against good teams you know on, on a big expansive pitch uh, like the Aviva you're going to have to ride your luck maybe a little bit but I still felt there was some patch, passages in that game of us trying to build up through 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 the lines that that I wouldn't have seen before, well, obviously in recent times, and obviously the the, the performance against Portugal a couple of days before that was was very good. So, you know, I, I'm encouraged by it. I'm enjoying watching Ireland. Obviously, I'd I'd be invested in regards. I'd have a vested interest in it in regards. Stephen's my old manager, and obviously really willing them to do to do so well but um, I've um, I've been encouraged by the last two performances in, in the regard of them enjoying watching watching Ireland play again they're, they're involved in in entertaining games what is team talk and there like comes today? a point where you have to start off if you want to change something there comes a starting point and we're at that starting point I think in regards playing young players and the way we're trying to play and obviously there's going to be you're not going to change the whole thing upside down and also win every game uh, off the back of it. So there's going to be, obviously, development issues. But on the whole, you know, you can see by the players, they're, they're definitely buying into the ideology of it. There can be no question that regarding their commitment or the effort or the honesty of effort. So there's obviously lots going on behind the scenes that the players are hugely encouraged by in regards to coaching and that Um so I've seen some interviews, obviously players are going to maybe say positive things, but I think they've gone in depth in regards. A lot of them have, have preached about the level of coaching that they're getting, you know, and they join up. So, um, you know, I think I think it's highly encouraging. Obviously, today today is a very big game in regards. We've played Luxembourg and Azerbaijan already. So, yeah, you know, you'd, you'd like to think we, we'll win one of those games in regards today away to Azerbaijan. But, you know, the... Gone are the days, I think, of you see with results all across the board in international football. I think gone are the days where it's an open goal that international matches play one of the weaker nations and you can chalk it down as a two or three nil. Or I think all the nations, through development and, and investment, are, are getting by be- and getting better at grassroots, and that's shown itself at senior level. So, um, every game's competitive, and I think if you look across the board, you know, you saw a little instance Romania have been in the doldrums last. The last 10 or 15 years, they went 1-0 up, nearly got a result away to Germany last night. So, um, I think a lot more evenly matched nations now. Uh, just for our people just joining us, you're listening to the St. Patrick's Athletic Manager, Stephen O'Donnell, myself, Shane Hannan and Johnny Ward is in studio with me. Uh, we're just talking about the Irish team that's uh, been announced there as well. And just to run you through the substitutes as well, which I uh, missed out on, uh, Cuevin Kelleher and Mark Travers, of course, the two uh, goalkeepers on the bench. We've got Enda Stevens, Conor Hurrahan, Troy Parrott, Nathan Collins, Cyrus Christie, Harry Arter, Jamie McGrath, James Collins, uh, Chiodozi Ogbeni and Aaron Connolly on the bench, of course. Jason Knight misses out through illness and uh, Will Keane uh, of Wigan called up for the first time but he hasn't uh, been included in Stephen Kenny's matchday squad of 23 the Connolly one is interesting isn't it because um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know like if um, you know this, it's been said that there's a little bit potentially of tension in the camp as Connolly's um, 
playing maybe when he wasn't playing overly well um, and I thought there were you know aspects of the, his performance against Portugal at one level it was encouraging but I thought his, his decision making was horrendously mm. bad he was obviously taken off at half time against Azerbaijan and it's interesting Stevie where he's at now that you know he's basically gone with the with Horgan ahead of him yeah obviously look a lot of people sort of you know from the outside in um you know, it's very black and white, but obviously Stephen and the coaching staff are privy to, to training and the build up to games. They're privy to the specifics and the, maybe the little nuances of the opposition. They might identify weaknesses that might be better for one game for Aaron to Connolly to play in and then another, you know, like today, they might think it'll suit Darl Horgan uh, more so to go away, boys, I might add. So it's great for us, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, and Johnny, 40 as well. Galway, Galway taking over, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, wouldn't have been on the map, really, of Irish internationals 15, 20 years ago, so we're, we're getting good numbers in now. Um, but, as I said, you know, the horses for courses a lot, but it's good to have, um, I think, Daryl Horgan, any time he's come on or started, has been very encouraging. He's, he is one of our players that are capable, if he gets it isolated out wide and standing the full back up, he's capable of going both ways. And you would get a little bit of excitement when he, get, when he gets it in the final third. So, you know, when the game opens up a little bit more, then Aaron Connolly could utilise his pace and his direct running off it to, to get in. You know, he could have had a penalty against Portugal and he got in on the inside left in the first half and, you know, just missed at a tight angle. So, he got big opportunities also. He is a threat. I think a couple of weeks ago, was it, in the in the League Cup, he scored two for Brighton. So, um, you know, that will do his confidence no harm. What's what's Stephen Kenny's team talk today from your experience of him? Um, one thing he will, and I think you can see in regards to his team selection and that he's brave. He's brave, you know, it wasn't a point of we need to maybe consolidate a little bit and, and get a couple of solid results. Um you know, I'm a Baba Daly. You can see when uh, we got an injury against Portugal, he fired him in, you know, in the first half when Dar O'Shea obviously got what it was looking, looked like a nasty looking injury. It wasn't a case we get more experience on the pitch. He'll go with his gut and he's adventurous and he's a risk taker. And, you know, that uh, people from the cheap seats and that can say he should, uh, should, when you're in. When you're in that on that sideline and you have like obviously a lot a lot of pressure, the easiest thing is to be conservative. But that's one thing he can't be accused of is 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 being conservative. He's a, he's a risk taker and he'll want um, players to go and express themselves. A lot of managers Monday to Friday, if you're playing on a Saturday, are all about possession boxes and players expressing themselves in training and then come a match day. You know, obviously, it's it's consolidation, and all all of a sudden, the encouragement to go and play football goes out the window, and it's just about being solid. Um, Stephen, he can never be accused of that. He's uh, he wants players to express themselves, and he does have a ideology of his dream would be Aviva being packed and fans coming to watch Ireland play and being excited and being really excited about the way they play and being really excited about watching you know, ambitious, adventurous individuals, creative individuals, because that's the way that's the way he wants all his teams to play. He wants people getting their money's worth and being exciting to watch more so than anything, I would say. He has dealt with the pressure fairly well as well, I'd argue, because when you th- when you think not 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 notwithstanding the fact that he pretty much had a heart attack, um as as he exposed obviously to Nathan on the show here, and um, notwithstanding that, when you think of um but the thoughts going through his mind when we were beaten at home to Luxembourg, a result that looked a lot worse because it's Luxembourg than it actually was, in that we, we're not really entitled necessarily to be beating Luxembourg anymore. But anyway, so you have that. 1-0 down in Andorra when I think, you know, people would probably say if we lost that game, he could well be gone because you're losing to Andorra. We were 1-0 down against Azerbaijan with five minutes to go and we were basically then on the cusp of losing at home to Serbia and he's gone through an awful lot of, of, of tough moments in games and out of games even. Yeah, what I would say probably, I think the Serbian game, probably the fortuitous equaliser near the end was maybe the first bit of good fortune (laughs) he's probably had in his reign in regards to COVID and serious players being out. And then obviously you have the the Portuguese game just before that two goals in injury time. So, you know, there was times against even going as far back as against uh, Slovakia in the playoffs, thought we were the better team. I think Conor Horan missed from four yards out mm. maybe to go and give us the win. Then the penal shootout, we lose. Um, so I think there's been lots and lots of little breaks that can, you know, that definitely can de- determine 
uh, a manager's faith uh, have gone against them and hopefully the Serbian game maybe brighten the look uh, uh, Bazuna being so good for us you know in a few breakaways Serbia maybe had the opportunity to go two up kept it to 1-0 and got a fortuitous maybe goal that I think he's deserved o- overall with his reign so hopefully we kick on from that now again today and I think the outside looking in and the picture will look a lot brighter come seven o'clock if we have a win under our belts I think we can start he can start really building then you know we have a win competitive win let's build and kick on from here between now and the end of the qualifying and then into the Nations League games Do we need to win? Obviously you know there comes a time where you you need to get results um, and I think obviously we're all well aware that um, you know it's I would think it, it it is a big game in regards, um, you know, the the outcome of the results. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really positive about it. I think I think we will win. Um, I think we will win. I think the players are are in a positive frame of mind in regards. From the outside, it might be a little bit more negative, but I I see from our last two performances, players are, are playing with confidence. I thought Jeff Hendrick in the first half against Serbia was the best. Uh, at the Aviva was the best he's played in a long, long time for Ireland. And obviously he's come off the back of scoring last week uh, against Wolves. So hopefully he carries that little bit of confidence into the game. And, you know, I think we have enough players in, in the attacking areas of the pitch and we have enough attacking options on the bench to go go and get the win today. Very finally, Stephen, uh, score prediction. You're going for the Irish win. What's what's it going to be? Two zip, Ireland. I'm going I like the it. same, yeah. Two zip. I said same earlier, yeah. It's yeah. Gavin Comiskey, 2 0 Ireland yesterday. We take yeah. it, we take it. Uh, Stephen, thanks a million for, for joining us this afternoon. Really uh, pleasure to chat to you. Thanks very much, Thanks for the, the cup game. as well, CB. Hey, tough game. Dundalk are hitting a bit of form, so but it's good to be in the hat anyway in the semi final, so we're looking forward to it. Great stuff. Have my old friend Higgins first next week in the Brandywell. Yeah, I know what you said, old friend. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's gone. Relationship gone. Best of luck with it, Stevie. Listen, appreciate you right, taking cheers. the call this afternoon. Great stuff. Thanks. That's uh, Steve McDonald, right. the Patrick's Athletic Manager. We'll be back uh, after four o'clock. Kevin Doyle will oh, join us. Stephen McDonald there. Stephen O'Donnell, sorry, Steve yes. McDonald might be involved in Dundalk, actually. I'm thinking um, of Daniel McDonald, our good Daniel friend. Who's How, back here. You're always thinking of Daniel I know, McDonald. I know. We'll check in with him after, uh, after the ad break at four o'clock. We'll continue with OTB Football Saturday right after the news. Book. Yeah, you're very welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. Shane Hannan with you in for John Duggan until 5 pm this evening. So, for the next hour or so, plenty of build up to the Azerbaijan versus Republic of Ireland qualifier that gets underway at 5 o'clock in Baku. Football and Off the Ball brought to you by Sky. All the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports. We were joined in the uh, first hour there of the uh, Football Saturday from 3 to 4 by the St. Patrick's Athletic Manager Stephen O'Donnell. He predicted a 2 0 win for Ireland tonight and for Stephen Kenny's men we'll have Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent on the line from Baku with us uh, very shortly as well we've got Johnny Ward in studio the footballer or the football, footballer I, call, I called you I'm sure you were a footballer at one point Johnny you're a broadcaster and journalist many now. dreams but many dreams you wake up. <laughs> yeah, one man who was a footballer certainly is the former Republic of Ireland international striker Kevin Doyle is on the line with us now afternoon Kevin afternoon Shane yeah. we are we're getting nervous we're getting excited we're, I don't know if you've had a chance to see the, the starting team um, it's, it looks like a 3 4 2 1, I guess, Kevin. It, it, Gavin Bazunu and goals back three. You would have to say Andrew Amabamadele, John Egan, the captain, um, and Shane Duffy. And then the four, if, if that's what we're going with, Matt Doherty out wide right, McLean wide left. And then you've got Josh Cullen and Jeff Hendrick in the middle. Uh, the two, then, I guess, behind Alameda would be, would be Daryl Horgan and Callum Robinson. Is that, how, is that how you're reading this team? Yeah, I'm just writing this down. I've been out with the kids and I'm only in the door, so <laughs> it looks I wasn't like, sure. Yeah, he does fit anyway. I was worried about him. He does fit. Him, yeah, but. Jason Knight hasn't made it, and, and Will Keane's not in the 23. I guess Daryl Horgan being yeah. preferred to Aaron Connolly. Aaron Connolly's on the bench is one of the the headlines. Some people probably thought Jamie McGrath should get into the team. So just to go through mm-hmm. for you again, Gavin Bazunu and goals back yeah. three. If that's what we're saying, Andrew Omabamadele, Shane Duffy, and John Egan. Then the four. You're, you're looking at Matt Doherty wide right. James McLean wide left uh, and then in the centre Josh Cullen with Jeff Hendrick and then Adamita up top with uh, behind him the two of Daryl Horgan and Callum Robinson so it's a, it's an interesting looking team like it's I guess we, we were talking in the first hour there about Stephen Kenny often making brave brave choices with his yeah. teams but it's not a bad starting lineup. No it's a- there's not too many there that wouldn't surprise you I'd imagine uh, McLean wasn't sure if he'd play or not Horgan was the one. He was very good when he came on. It was in the Azerbaijan game at home for about five or ten minutes and then went through a spell where he couldn't pass the ball five yards. But he 
when he plays well for Ireland, he plays very well, but he just he's a bit inconsistent. Um, Robinson was good when he came on in that game as well, and fit he has to start. Um, and Ida, in fairness, he really impressed me in this couple of games. Um, never looked like scoring, but his whole hold-up play, his strength, he looks a lot quicker, he looks a lot fitter than he did when Stevens started picking him first last year. He's really developed over the summer, so... Uh, be nice to him. Listen, he needs a goal. Put a bit of ice in on those few performances. He has to be a little bit more selfish. He spends a, the role he's got being the one up top. He spends a lot of time out wide and a lot of time doing a lot of the dirty work. And he also needs to think of himself a little bit and get in the box a bit more. But the, the team is sort of. I'm glad he went with the three at the back. He, mm. Like give him a chance to stick with it. You need to a bit of consistency in in the defence there. Um, you know, so many changes over the last year and a half. You know, stick with the formation, stick with lads, get them used to playing beside you, get it, so it's second nature. So I'm glad he's sticking with one formation. So um, I'd imagine, you'd imagine that is the formation. Um, the, 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 Azer, the, the Azerbaijan game at home, um, Kevin, the, you know, they, they obviously, it, it was probably going okay at nil all, even as much as we, yeah. we weren't great in the second quarter of the game. But it's, like sometimes as a player, is it easier to in a way to like Ireland are we're, we're obviously a shorter odds at home than they are away but it, they're, they're not you're, you're not expecting Azerbaijan to completely park the bus today and we've, we we do have three pacey players in, in forward areas to exploit that hopefully yeah and we've never been particularly good at home have we against mm. <laughs> again, you know our preferred performances as everyone knows come against the better teams it seems we're able to raise our game and we struggle we struggle when we have to be the one dominating possession or meant to be the one to dominate possession against a so-called weaker team. So away from home, you know what? I, I never felt it made any difference with us. It, a little bit less pressure away from home, not as expected as much. Be expected to sit back a bit more. Um, so it just, yeah, it just felt easier. You know, it, it didn't... I never felt a difference with Ireland. I'm sure the results, and you look through it, maybe there was, but I never felt a difference for us playing at home or away from home. Um, probably a little bit easier away from home at times. Um, the crowd at home is a totally different when we're playing a big team. I'm sure you've noticed. Like if you're playing one of the top teams at home, the crowd are brilliant. Everyone massive noise. Whereas when you're playing an Azerbaijan at home, it's more of an expected. You know why aren't we dominating this game? Why why haven't we got 78 percent possession? Why are Macedonia outplaying us or, or whatever it might be? Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan at half time. You know we were all right in the first half against Azerbaijan at home, but still when I got to half time, talking about stats and possession, and we're now a sort of possession-based team, it was 50-50 on possession at halftime in that game, as, as okay as we played in the first half. So um, it just suits us away from home more. Um, I think you're right. I, I think this will be, it won't be an easy game, but I'd be a little more confident. I wasn't confident before that home game at all. Other people were more confident than me. I, I thought it was going to be a really tough game. I think this, I think we have a better chance tonight than we did at home of getting getting a win. Not saying that we will, but I think it will it'll suit us a bit more. Like a lot of people, Kevin, in the build-up this week have, have been pointing out that he's only four games remaining, essentially, Kenny, before that contract is either renewed yeah. or ended. Like, that's three qualifiers and one friendly next week against Qatar. Yet to win a competitive game in 12 attempts uh, under Stephen Kenny. Like, at what point do the results really matter? Like, is this, is this do or die? Is this win or bust for Stephen Kenny tonight? No, it's not. There's never one game, I think, is win or bust. Um... Results matter. Every game matters. You know, it's not a case of we haven't won in 12 or whatever it might be. It's every game's important. We all know the pressure he's under. He knows the pressure he's under. He's not stupid. Um, and and the reason he's been given this length, and, and I think we've all been very popular, like, as much as any Ireland manager, more so, he's been given a sort of, you know, a, a reasonably easy ride, I'd say, regarding results, because we know the squad he has. You know, in the main, in the main, he's been given an easy ride. Plenty of people have criticised, but you have to criticise as well. You can't. It's not all. You know, I I think in the main, he's he has he is the worst squad of Irish players any managers had in not the worst squad. Sorry, the most inexperienced, youngest mm. squad of Irish players. I don't want really to call them bad. There's they're decent potential there, but it's not the squad of players any managers had in the last twenty years. Um, so that's why. I'm on the side of giving him a bit more time. I still criticise some of his decisions. I think he went too quick, too soon in getting rid of some of the older players. I think he should focus a lot more on the here and now and some of the things he could make a difference on rather than always look into the bigger picture and our style of play. I think there's, you know, I, I'm, I disagree with some of his things, but in the, you know, in the main, you know, who do you replace? Who do you replace? If you go, okay, Stephen Kenny goes tomorrow, who, who do you get in now? <laughs> Who's it's going to make a massive difference and, and do anything different that he's done? I think... You need to let him see it out four games 
and, and, and sit down and have a real long think about it then and, and not make a rash decision or, or go like we lose tonight, he has to go. Um, it it's, has to be thought about. It, has to, it makes so many knee-jerk reactions. It all has to be taken into account. And I still think, you know, given the squad of players he's had, he he's had a really tough job. And I'm just reiterating here, I, I, do, I would have done different some of the things he's done and I disagree with some of the things he's done. And when he says we've played fantastic against teams and, and conceded three goals, to me that's not fantastic. Um, or going away and conceding two goals and, and saying it was a, you know, an unbelievable performance. Uh, well, I mean, concede two goals is not. When you let two crosses, like Portugal, let two simple crosses come into the box, that's not an unbelievable performance. That's mm. where he used to come out and say, well, that's the stuff that annoys me, where he should come out and say, you know what, we played well, but we didn't because we let two simple crosses into the box, lost two headers and lost a game that we should have got something from against Portugal I'm talking about here. So stuff like that where I'd like him to be a bit more specific, a bit more, listen, not always going on about what we're going to do next year or the year after. We could have won a game like that if we'd have done a few simple things. The stuff we're good at, defending. We have an experience back four or five. That's probably the, you know, our most experienced players, our, most of our Premier League players come from that defence and we haven't kept a clean sheet and I don't know how long whether it's Andorra away or whoever so things like that annoy me and frustrate me a bit but I also see why it's been so difficult for him and why I'd be willing to give him more time That's a very good point about the clean sheets because I don't think anyone could I know you're saying we don't have a great bunch of players but like I, I think any manager would snap up um the prospects that we have in terms of goalkeepers and centre backs for the next yeah. 10 years so we have that base but this is this is for Kevin Doyle Kevin like if you look at if you add David McGoldrick's stats for Ireland with every striker that's played since he um, departed the scene, the the outlay from David McGoldrick and those other strikers has been absolutely shocking. So, so bad. We need goals. Like, we need somebody. We need an either or Robinson or, um, or Horgan. We need goals from one of the forward players today to surely make a statement because we, we can't function as a team if we're still reliant on Duffy to score a goal from a set piece or yeah. to come off the arse of a defender. <laughs> Yeah, um, I agree, and and that's where I worry because I don't know if you're going to get goals from from um, from Ida. Um, he just does. He hasn't looked like scoring for Ireland yet. He needs to just, you know, be as I said. I spoke already. Be a bit more selfish. I don't think Darren Horgan gets too many goals. Aaron Connolly to me has the potential. He got he's got a lot of stick in his few games with Ireland, and he frustrates. But he's the one that has that bit of magic. I just love him. I'd love him, from what I hear, I'd love someone to sit down and, and really drill it into him how important this next year or two is for his career. You know, it can be soon forgotten about. Um, mm. And he has so much natural talent, skill and speed. And he frustrates at times. But you've seen somebody, I know he hasn't scored on a regular basis, but you do see some of the goals he does score. When he does score, they're good goals. And I'd love him to, I'd love the manager, I'm sure he is, and the club manager, um, to get him because he could be the one who would be a difference maker for Ireland Adam Mead is fine he's not going to be a difference maker player he's going to be a, an important team player and hold up the ball player and he's going to score a load of goals for Ireland he'll get the odd goal I'm sure but Aaron Connolly could get goals for Ireland um, you know other than that that's why I think clean sheets are so important because we're not going to get too many goals it's always going to be the odd goal the odd one nil or whatever it might be so make the most of our strong defence as you, as you said there's you know it's a decent back five there Two goalkeepers, I would nearly say our sub goalkeeper is better. I would say Cuban <laughs> Kelleher is, you know, equally good, if not better than Bazuna. Um, How can you say that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, he you're is. dealing with an absolute he's... superstar here. Like, <laughs> yeah, Bazuna was it's fab. I'm not saying Bazuna, I, I'm, he's obviously top class. Bazuna has the potential to be top class, he's not top class yet, but he's a really good player. But Cuban Kelleher, for me, when I've seen him come into that Liverpool team, you know, under real pressure and it just looks like he's there his whole life, um, anytime he plays. So, Listen, equally, if no up, you, either one, you're happy, aren't you, when you play either them and, and the rest of our back five, you'd be happy with it on any, you know, any international team over the years with Ireland, that'd be fairly decent back five. So, um, you you know, that's why I just, you know, Andorra, stuff frustrates me. I'm going back over this, you know, you're like, all right, we have to score goals, right? Say Andorra, we went one nil down to a set piece against Andorra. <laughs> and, and just the thing that frustrated me with the manager, no one else seemed to bother him at the time, but he said afterwards, well, we, we haven't practiced set pieces. And just like, like, how can you even say, I'd be embarrassed to say I haven't practiced set pieces and they've been mm. together for 10 days in a summer camp and we've got meant to be fabulous coaches. Now, I don't know how you go 10 days without practicing set pieces and then we, we conceded the simplest goal ever against Andorra. And you're on about trying, like for us now, clean sheets. We're not scoring goals, but at least we can keep clean sheets and it takes the pressure off. And then if we do nick the odd goal, we might win a game. But if we can't keep a clean sheet, 
and we're not scoring. We have no hope. So just, you know, I, I'm i not, I, I know the job he has is tough. And I'm, I'm really in the middle. You know, people seem to be in one camp or the other with the manager and everything with Ireland. And so you can't say I'm bad about the manager or, or the manager's no good or whatever it is. I'm really in the middle. I think he's had a really tough job and I think he should be left in it for the time being. But I also think he could do could have done things differently and got some results along the way that would have, you know, would have eased the pressure on him big time. Because it's a tough, tough job for anyone, any manager getting that job. One aspect. Really difficult the last year. Absolutely. Uh, like one aspect that, that might play into our hands is the fact that it's not really going to be a, an intimidating atmosphere in Baku tonight. It's the Baku Olympic Stadium, sixty-eight thousand seven hundred capacity. Won't be full, of course. Only a few hundred Irish fans. But uh, Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent is uh, standing by. Potentially noisy uh, Olympic Baku Stadium. I think Dan, uh, can you hear us? Okay. I can. If you can hear me, okay, Shane. It's you a, tell me. We can. We can. We can. We can hear you just about. What's What's the atmosphere like? Like I think is it three hundred, three hundred fifty well, Irish fans. Uh, well, there's around 10,000 policemen outside the ground and in the vicinity of the stadium, uh, but there's, there's hardly anyone actually inside it. Um, hardly any spectators here, really, so it's not going to be intimidating, I don't think. It's going to be uh, like it's a massive stadium, it's, but there's almost that closed doors vibe to it, you know what I mean? Albeit 40 minutes from kickoff and... I am listening to some local horrendous pop music, as you can hear, sort of uh, sort of pumping over the, the airwaves. So, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, it's, I'm in danger of going full partridge here after taking 90 <laughs> minutes to get into this, 90 minutes to get into the stadium with a very uh, animated uh, series of discussions with local police officers, none of whom knew where the entrance was. So. Um, it's a great country, this. It's a fascinating country in some respects, but um, it's heavily securitized. And certainly, um, I'm wondering why only 6,000 people are going to uh, the game tonight, apparently. Maybe it's just because it's so bloody hard to get into the stadium. Like, it is uh, if, if If we struggle to break down their defence tonight, if Ireland struggles to break down their defence, if, 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 if getting into the stadium is almost like a, a symbol for what it's like to break down Azerbaijan, we're in trouble. But we have a little window of silence here. We have a little window of silence. Lovely. So You can't beat uh, an old dictatorship, Dan. I mean, they, listen, they, they, they've been through a lot here in the last while. And the only thing I've noticed, Johnny, you were here in 2019 with me. They seem to have added more flags. It's like they went back. It's like the episode of uh, Father Ted where Dougal's going round the roundabout and they say... You know, well, let's just say another mass. I think here they've just had a meeting and they've said we need more flags. Um, now, the thing is, like, they, they have be, actually been involved in a war in the last year, so it should be too, too flippant about it, where, where thousands of people have, have died, yet you can sort of wander through Baku and this sort of opulent, uh, you know, city centre, you know, you know, wonderful, like, clean streets, you know, uh, modern Western shops, you know, because the... Uh, the leader's wife, who was also the vice president, as it, as it so happens, apparently is very fond of the high-end shopping. So uh, they've, they've created some shopping districts that are to her and the, the, the wider uh, Azeri elite classes liking. So What have you done for your wife lately? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I went into a souvenir shop today and bought something for around three quid. <laughs> um, but, no, listen, it's, it's, but it is strange. Like, I mean... It's a stunning arena, and it's like a, it looks like a, a decent surface, although it's very hard to know, and like a great arena to play football. But it's, I'm sure Kevin's there, and it's occasionally you're in a massive stadium, but it's quite empty. So it's not like you're going to have this intimidating cauldron of an atmosphere that naturally like raises the adrenaline levels, or you know, like that that game in Hungary in June. I wasn't at it, but. You could see it was like a 10,000-seater stadium, very tight, very packed. And that probably gave the game a natural energy, whereas here it's, it's going to be a different type of uh, ball game completely. And, and, like, you know, the, the temperatures are fine. I know people will say it's a tough place to come and all of that, but really it's not a massive... It's maybe a little bit surreal to some degree, but no real excuses from a setup perspective you know in terms of the stadium and the backdrop and the temperatures will that have an impact Kevin like I know as Dan mentions it's it's not exactly Tehran in 2001 this isn't a real intimidating atmosphere empty empty stadium essentially 
uh, for such a big stadium. Like, does that have an impact on, on, on the team when it's an away game, but it doesn't really have that, uh, I guess, slice of intimidation? Um, no, I don't think it will. Um, listen, it, it should take from the home team more than us. Um, no, we. I just, I'm just when you're saying that in an away game in an empty state, I remember playing. Um, was it Georgia who'd been in a war as well with Russia, and we played them in Germany? I don't know, around in uh, Mainz. 2010 or something like that, and it was an empty stadium, and you suited us, we won the game. Um, and it definitely took from a easier to go there and play in a quiet ground than having to go to some Tbilisi. It would have been, I suppose, with Georgia and, and play in front of a hostile home crowd, and the same going to Azerbaijan, uh, I'd imagine. It's quite only six thousand dancer that it can only be an advantage to us. Yeah, for sure. I'm actually uh, quite enjoying the Azerbaijani music. I think they've done quite well in the Eurovision Song Contest uh, in recent years. Yeah. Johnny, they're quite well. Dan, are you hearing the same as we've been kind of, I guess, discussing the, the starting eleven here and deciding amongst ourselves it was possibly a three-four-two-one formation uh, with Robinson and, and McLean behind, or sorry, Robinson and Horgan behind uh, Ida. You think along the same lines? Oh yeah, yeah. Look, Stephen Kenny spoke to a couple of us yesterday and effectively made it clear that that would be the system, yeah. And it can be, like, you know, there's variations of that, obviously. Like, it can be, it, it could, at times, it can be more like a 3-4-3 three, three, um, in the sense of Horgan and Robinson being encouraged to, like, press high and wide. And it was very clear from speaking to Stephen Kenny yesterday, but to me, anyway, that there was going to be changes in that department. I'm not surprised Aaron Connolly was dropped. I think... The feeling was in the first game last month that Azerbaijan, it was far too easy for them to play the ball out um, of their own, of, you know, of their own defensive sort of third. And I know Keith Andrews spoke last week. I think with Joe, he was asked, was like a deliberate, was it an Irish tactic to stand off? And I don't think that was the case. I think Hor- or say, I think Connolly was just very low on energy. He was lethargic. He was taken off at half time. And I don't think with Troy Parrott, that's his natural game necessarily. And as a result, uh, there was no sort of uh, impetus from the front three and it fell flat. And, and after 10, 15 minutes, Azerbaijan were able to play their way out very comfortably. Now, I thought potentially it might be Jamie McGrath uh, or maybe even Ogbeni, who, who definitely I think will get on the pitch today, um, who might come into it. Uh, as opposed to Horgan. But Horgan makes perfect sense as well in the sense that I think he's he hasn't done a huge amount wrong under Kenny. Um, he's you know he's he's energetic, he's sort of a bustling presence and I think he'll be he'll be looking I think to Horgan and Robinson probably to set the tone and some of the triggers in terms of sort of pressing and, and hitting the right areas that it makes it difficult for Azerbaijan who according to Kenny they can be quite slow in their own half and, and they're happy to sort of patiently try and play themselves out of trouble. And in Dublin, Ireland just let them settle and made it far too easy for them to do that. Um, and I think the the, the, the job, the, the task at hand here will be certainly be that front three of Ireland uh, to, to really set the tone and, and set the tempo there for sure. It's funny because Johnny's uh, pointing at the television here for me and uh, UEFA have uh, have listed Andrew Omobamadeli as the attacking midfielder <laughs> sitting behind Adam Ida. So uh, I saw the same on live score myself and I uh, did a double take because they think Omobamadeli is going to be behind Adam Ida, which would be uh, quite interesting, a little uh, Norwich pairing there. But uh, I don't think that's going to happen tonight. Uh, like Kevin, when, when we're talking here about this Irish team and I'm just looking at the at the youth even in front of me here, like Omobamadeli himself, he's 19 years of age, he's getting a third cap, Bazunu 19, his eighth cap and an eleventh cap for twenty old Alameda I mean it's not to say it's an excuse for Stephen Kenny but I mean God forbid if Ireland were to lose this game tonight or even draw you can just imagine him coming out afterwards and pointing to the fact that you know these are a lot of young players these guys are just building up caps for the next for the next qualification campaign it's already a fact that we're not going to qualify but it's not really an excuse we need results here and now um, well, it is like it, it's not an excuse. It's just a justified reason, isn't it? We have a young, inexperienced squad, and it's definitely it's the reason Stephen has been given time and be given this opportunity to try see it through. Um, got, getting to around ten caps, that was my sort of point in my international career where I started to feel a little bit comfortable in it and I'm more confident in around the place and just more at home in the squad. So they're they're all starting to get to that point now. They've sort of weathered that first year, really tough first year for him, and you hope you start to see, I think with Ida, we started to see a bit more of an improvement. Amabama Daly was excellent. Um, and Pizuna looked looked really comfortable in the two games. So, listen, we're getting to that point now where this should we should start to see the fruit of that last year of tough going, I suppose. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm going back to the game tonight. There's nothing wrong with us being solid and sitting in. At times, we're away from home. We can't just think we're, you know, Sasa by Chan, we're going to go out and dominate the game. There's nothing wrong with us. Just, you know, what I say about being solid, and people get the wrong impression, think, oh, you're going to be solid. That's just defensive and boot the ball long and, and get it clear every time you chance to get it as far away from our goal as you can. It's not. We can still play out. We'll have plenty of the ball. Gavin Bazuna, they all look comfortable on it. Um, I just mean, not be as open, not be as stretched at times, not be as, you know, even from kickouts, not be putting ourselves in position that if we do lose the ball, we're all over the place on the pitch. Um, just being a little bit clever, both ends of the pitch. Um, trying to get a result. You know, I'm, I'm enjoying watching us play. I'm enjoying watching us trying to play. But you have to also defend well, defend strong, and go through points in the game where there's nothing wrong with being ugly, taking a clean sheet, five minutes of managing a game maybe or whatever. And we don't seem to have that yet. We seem to be all, unless we play perfect football at all times, this isn't this isn't international football or this isn't the way I want to play. So we can't do anything off rolling out from the back at every opportunity and trying to play under pressure at all times and trying to do the perfect ball at all times when... We have young and experienced players on the pitch and we're away from home. This is a time to be a little bit more pragmatic while not booting the ball long for 90 minutes. There, there is a, it isn't an either or. You can't mix it. So yeah. I'd just I, like to see a bit more professionalism in that sort of sense. I, th- I think in fairness, we did see that against Serbia where, you know, Bazuna was apt to hit and kind of almost like GEA type um, Cluxton type passes to the wing that, that actually he was really, really good with the ball at his feet for that. that but yeah. I, the ideal scenario, Kevin, is that one of our strikers uh, or one of the attacking players scores in the first half the Azerbaijan coach himself is under a bit of pressure they have to kind of come out in the second half and then with a team that's somewhat stretched we can bring on the likes of Ogbeni and Aaron Connolly and and then win 2-0 or something like that hopefully that's what happens yeah (laughs) obviously hopefully yeah it'd be nice wouldn't it to see us go 1-0 up fairly early in the game exactly. we also have a couple of chances early in the game don't we play quite well for the first 10 or 15 minutes create a chance to do it and don't take it and then you know he said we didn't press sign the Azerbaijan game at home I thought we did early on and then we didn't take that one or two sort of half chance and we ended up sitting back deep and they scored that goal just before halftime a real killer goal um, in that game as well Troy Parrott played and he looked really uncomfortable in the position he was playing he wasn't sure whether he was a centre forward or a winger or where to go when we didn't have the ball so you know, it just didn't look like he knew what position to take up with the ball or without the ball. So, you know, there's a few reasons why we probably didn't press as well as we could. Um, tonight, it's been more natural for Horgan and Robinson in those positions than it would have been for Troy Parrott. Troy Parrott, to me, be more, you know, up front on his own or as part of the two up front. And he, he just didn't seem comfortable in that game at all. I felt sorry for him. So, um, with and without the ball, it looks, it looks on paper like, and we always, you know, on paper, it looks great. Everything's great on paper, but... They're all in a position that they're comfortable playing in. There's no one out of position. There's no one doing something they don't know what they're meant to do. So you'd hope they'll get the shape right with and without the ball. And just a bit of luck. Stephen hasn't had any luck. You know, one of my lucky managers, good managers. Is he a good manager or a lucky manager? He hasn't had. He definitely isn't a lucky manager in the last year. <laughs> Everything's gone against him. He's lucky he's um, alive, I'd say. That's, a, that's the one thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. Laugh about it. Um, so, listen... There's a chance for them to go tonight with not missing too many strangers. Seamus Coleman, but Matt Doherty playing right wing back. It's not a massive loss for them there. So when you have Matt Doherty to slip in there and who has played well for her in the last couple of games. So, um, listen, we should have enough, shouldn't we? You can go through that as and they're under pressure. Their manager was under pressure coming into the game at home. That was a massive result for them. Um, we don't have excuses, Kevin. That's the, we, there are literally no excuses whatsoever tonight. No, there's not. Well, we, we've listed off our inexperiences. There is, there is excuses, I suppose. But when you go through the players, you go through the clubs they play for. Listen, they have as many issues as Azerbaijan as we have, um, and they're under pressure as well. So, um, I suppose the only thing you think of is we're away from home, um, and no, no game's easy. I've played in loads of games for Ireland against teams like the likes of Kazakhstan and people like that, and they're not easy. It's tough. You need to, you know, you need you need things to go your way. Um, as I said Stephen needs a bit of luck in this game when we start strong when we press high like he seems he says he wants us to do don't let him play when we win the ball back high up the pitch I love the fact we come out and I wish more over the years we'd come out and pressed high because we have the players and the energy over the years to do it we always seem to be listen we're playing against the team we, we're the ones who sit back when, and then when we win the ball back we didn't have the players to break teams down we never have 
had real creative players to break teams down. When you win the ball high up the pitch, you don't need that creative player. You've won the ball high up the pitch. You can hopefully get in the box and try to score a goal. And I think it would have suited us more over the years if we'd done that. Stephen is trying to play a bit like that, you know, and he talks about that. And Dan was saying this is what he spoke to him last night. He wants to press him up the pitch. He doesn't want him to play out. That's nice to hear away from home against an Azerbaijan. We should be able to do that against an Azerbaijan. Understandable, you can't do it maybe against some of the top teams. But against Azerbaijan, should be able to press high, win the ball back up, uh, high up the pitch. It means we don't have to have as much much creativity, which we don't have. Let's be honest, we don't have that real top class creative player. So um, hopefully something will fall out of me this way, or Darren Horgan, or Callum Robson has a goal in him. Obviously, um, it's so, written in the stars that he scores today. Surely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been an interesting week for him, hasn't it? So I'm um, sure he he's let a bit of frustration out in his celebration. We don't care if he scores. <laughs> like that, uh, Callum, do whatever you want. So, um, but scoring then. You know what? We score and then not retreating and sitting back for the rest of the game. If we can score early from all those chances, go again. Do you know we stay pressing high up the pitch? Um, you know, don't talk about the simple things. So many like Travatoni, right? He wasn't great. Our football wasn't good, but his one mantra always was he just shouted at details, details, details. You know, from set pieces, from corners, defensive. You know, in the last game, as a bit of James Coleman closing the player down. The little things, why you lose games, and you go through shape, and we didn't shape, or we did that and the other. Well, actually, it, it wasn't. It was a defender not closing someone down. It was Ronaldo, the two goals for Portugal. It wasn't that to do with our shape or our young players or anything. It was two lads on the left who didn't shut, close a cross down. Whether a cross coming in, closing them down and making it a difficult cross so he can't pick out Ronaldo, one of the best headers there's ever been of the ball in the box. You know, after Ronaldo scores the first goal, a detail, right? Listen, as the ball comes to the box, someone mark him the next time. No one marks him the second time a minute later. It's not to do with shape or inexperience. Or we have a strong experience back four. It's details win and lose you games. You know, focus on the details as much. They're just as important as that bigger picture, trying to restyle Irish football and this, that and the other. You know, details will get you, get Stephen a win away from home. And, um, and hopefully he's on those, the players and himself are on those details. Yeah, we have to we have to take a short ad break. We'll continue this uh, build up to Azerbaijan against the Republic of Ireland uh, kickoff, of course, at five o'clock. Uh, plenty of more build up to, to to come between now and then. Kevin Doyle, the former Irish international striker, is on the line there. Uh, the last voice you heard, Johnny Ward, the broadcaster and journalist, in studio with myself, Shane Hannan. Uh, get your text into us five three one zero six. What are your last ditch predictions for this match now this evening? Uh, plenty more build up to come. We'll we'll talk Stephen Kenny. We we'll get the match predictions. We might talk a bit of Callum Robinson as well in the week he's had uh, after this short ad break. Your sports. Very welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. Shane Hannan with you through now until five o'clock. Uh, we are building up to Azerbaijan versus the Republic of Ireland in the World Cup qualifier this evening. Stephen Kenny has named his team, of course. Uh, it's a three-four-one-two formation. We think Gavin Bazunu in goals. The back three of Andrew Omabamadele, Matt Doherty, and Shane Duffy. Uh, wide right, Matt Doherty. Wide left, James McLean. In the middle, Josh Cullen and Jeff Hendrick. And then the two in behind Adam Ida. It uh, looks like Daryl Horgan and Callum Robinson. The bench then, Quevin Kelleher, Mark Travers, Enda Stevens, Conor Hurrahan, Troy Parrott, Nathan Collins, Cyrus Christie, Harry Arter, Jamie McGrath, uh, James Collins, Chiodozi Ogbeni and Aaron Connolly is the bench. Uh, the broadcaster and journalist Johnny Ward is in studio with me and the former Irish international striker Kevin Doyle is on the line as well. Uh, Kevin, why just touch on, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on what was, uh, I guess, a difficult week for for per Callum Robinson. He uh, walked into a press conference at the start of the week and perhaps didn't expect the um, the fallout when he was pushed on the fact that he hasn't yet received the COVID-19 vaccine. He's uh, suffered from COVID-19 himself twice, uh, missed out on Irish caps as a result, and he was certainly pushed on it by the journalists present in the, in the press room. Uh, some people perhaps might say rightly so. Like John Giles was on, on the show with, uh, with us on Thursday night and he was saying unvaccinated footballers are privileged individuals who are a danger to themselves and others. Like, I don't know what your thought your thoughts on this are. Like, it's it's a tough spot for Stephen Kenny because he doesn't want to force players to be vaccinated. But when something something like this happens, it's always going to make the headlines. Yeah, like if I'm Callum, I'm just saying it's private information, lads. Whether I'm vaccinated or not, I'm not telling you. <laughs> and then it just stops all that, doesn't it? I don't know why he's come out and just put himself under that pressure. What I would say is, vaccinated. I know Shane Long's vaccinated, and in the last squad, he had to self-isolate mm. and stay out in Portugal for, I don't know, 10 days afterwards. So it seemed to make no difference whether he was vaccinated or not. He still got and was stuck out there. Um, this is his own, his own issue. And I'm, I'm really, like, he's, a, he's an adult, and it's not the law. So, listen, there's no, no point in us, you know, 
going saying he should or shouldn't do this or the other. Your ideal world, you'd say he should. But one thing I would say with athletes and footballers, um, I know as a player we were offered the, the flu vaccine every year. And I used to take it, I think, most years. But I do know a few of the lads used to say, no way that I took it last year and I wasn't right for months afterwards. It whacked my immune, I don't know, my energy or whatever it might be. Whether that was psychological or not, I don't know. But they said they weren't right and they didn't play well for months after taking it. So maybe that's something that is going around footballers in the dressing rooms or whatever. They're saying, I'm not, I'm not taking it. And I'm shooting this with tennis players as well. That, that affects their performance. Um, certainly don't affect... My performance now is easy for us to all say we'll take it off the run around for 90 minutes. But um, yeah, maybe that, I don't know. I don't know the reasons, but maybe that's one of the reasons why there seems to be a higher percentage of footballers anyway not taking taking it. But I'm in the sense that it's, you know, it's not the law that they have to take it. So listen, leave it up to them. It's they're all adults and it's their own business. Yeah, un- unlike in Azerbaijan, these players do not live in, a, in an autocratic uh, state. But at the same time, if you listen to Stephen Bradley, talk about the situation at Shamrock Rovers, um, it makes perfect sense. Basically, he said, I'm not compelling my players to get the vaccine. We live in a free world, but it might it might affect their employment and it might affect their general life if they don't. And that's a kind of a, you know, a, a somewhat veiled, I, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's a somewhat veiled, it, it just might affect your ability to play for Shamrock Rovers because obviously if you're not vaccinated, you could cause problems in the dress room. And I, I, I know what you're saying, uh, Kevin, but I don't think it reflects at all well on, on, on the intelligence of English footballers that two thirds of them apparently are not vaccinated in the Premier League. To me, that's glaringly and alarmingly um, uh, an indictment of, of the nonsense I think that a lot of them are listening to. Yeah, listen, I don't know. I'm not in the dressing rooms anymore and I don't be speaking to him, so I don't know what story's going around or why. I can only assume that it's my thought that the same that used to be with the flu vaccine. That's the thinking behind it. I don't know. Um, I can't speak for them anymore. Um, but listen, the two thirds of footballers aren't dumb, so I know that. Listen, it's like they're, they're, there's plenty of intelligent players there, whatever, where they're getting their information from, their source from, I can only assume that it's to do with that the, they're feeling on flu vaccines going back over the years, and that's why they aren't. Um, but I, I can't answer it. I, I, I'm wondering, Kevin, as well. To know. Like, it, there's, it's not, obviously, no, nobody's calling for mandatory vaccinations, but, like, I guess UEFA aren't insisting on the, on the vaccine cert, but unvaccinated players have to pass this PCR test three days before each match. They can still be pinged as well as close contacts. Vaccinated players are exempt on both of those fronts. Like, And look, it's a club-by-club club thing. I think Wolves have a 100% vaccination rate. You know, Manchester United are maybe 50% or thereabouts or just be below that. Like, It's certainly a different thing club-by-club. Club. But it's, it's, do you think it's something that maybe, you know, like you mentioned, the, the flu vaccine, like leaders in a dressing room, if, some, if someone's a leader in a dressing room, if you have a Roy Keane in a dressing room or someone who's going to speak up uh, and give their thoughts on it, like say you have someone in, in a dressing room that's maybe decided not to get the vaccine, like do you think that washes off on some of the other players that, you know, it, it really does depend on a dressing room by dressing room basis that really the, the I guess, leaders in the dressing room are, 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 are where this, 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 I guess, responsibility lies. <laughs> I don't know in this case because you, like all that stuff would be done privately with the club doctor. No one would know. You could tell the lads I've had it or haven't had it. They won't know whether you've had it or had the doc- club doctor can't tell. So they won't like, uh, you know, a leader can't influence you in that sense of the word. It's not going to be open, you know, in the dressing room. You can tell them whatever you like. So, um, no, like for just for your ease of life, you know what? You don't agree with the vaccine or whatever your theories are, whatever it might be. Wouldn't you just take it just for those reasons you said about PCR testing and all that and just the hassle? Why wouldn't you like why wouldn't you just get that out of the way and go and take it? But you know what? The, whatever the theories going around or the reasons are, I can only assume it's my what I told you already about the, the possibility of feeling unenergized or whatever and, and you know, from my experience with the flu vaccine over the years, but um yeah, I don't, I don't know the reason for it, but it must be, it must make your life, as we know, I was in the airport last week, it's quite a lot better to be, not have to be tested and do all that, and just make your life easier, make your club's life easier, make your teammates' lives easier, make your manager's lives easier, your supporters' lives easier, <laughs> but whatever, you know, whatever it is, there's, there's a higher percentage of athletes, not just footballers, it seems to be in tennis and a few others, you know, like, you know, stupid footballers. Where it's not, it seems to be not just uh, there's very highly ranked tennis players of the same. Uh, 
same opinion. So I don't know why why in sport I can know I said I can repeat myself, I can only assume it's to do with um the you know, they're feeling that when they're that fit and they get a vaccine it takes one or two percent out of them for a few months. I can only assume that's the reason. Yeah, like that, that what you've said there, making life easier is probably what a lot of people have been thinking when they heard Callum Robinson talking this week and like I was looking at the football journalist Manuel Veth, he was uh, on Twitter during the week and he said Football teams in Europe are so far behind North American leagues when it comes to vaccination. It's a personal choice, yes, but that personal choice should also come with a financial loss should they A, not be able to play, or B, infect teammates. And like that's the case for Callum Robinson. He missed out on a couple of... No, it's not his club. It's a couple, it's a couple of international caps. Uh, they're not paying his wages as such. But that is, that is the issue, really, where... You know, we wouldn't, people really wouldn't care if Callum Robinson did or didn't have the vaccine. Necessi- we wouldn't even know about it, essentially. But it's the fact that he's missed out on caps. Like, he could look back at the end of his career and, and maybe regret that. But then again, Kevin, like, as you said at the start, Jason Malumbi was in a, a Zoom call uh, start of the week. He just didn't get into it. Ida said, Adam Ida said he had taken the jab. So maybe Callum Robinson, maybe just a bit naive that he, that he went in depth in answering the question, I guess. He could have saved himself a lot of hassle, but I I, I want it. I, I would hate to see lads punny. Like, like you start right, this makes sense to take the, in my opinion, make the COVID COVID vaccine. But like, where do you stop then with you know in the future about different? I don't know. You go down the line of fining them for not putting something in their body that they don't want to put in their body, and and then you go along. Well, well, I just repeat with Shane Long. I don't know. I shouldn't be maybe telling his medical information, but I know he had the vaccine. He missed the game, so. Mm. You know, there are people missing games anyway. So where do you, you know, I don't know. You just, you just hope you don't want to force anyone to do anything. Do you? You don't need to. You don't need to be like finding people around. I just, you try to try to give them as much information as possible. And hopefully, they'll they'll what make what we think is the right decision. But you know, as I said, as as Johnny said, we don't live in Azerbaijan, and we're not uh, we're not dictators, and and you don't want to be going down the line of forcing someone to do that, especially when it's medical like that. As much as we would disagree with them, you know, they're they're saying a lot, but uh, saying we've heard a lot. It's their body and their choice, and you don't, you know, if there's no point if you force them to do it and you make it a rule and a law, you know, I don't know. I think that's gone too far, to be honest with you. But um, that's personal opinion on it yeah myself and Johnny were saying during the, the ad break it's uh, written in the stars that Callum Robinson is going to score a goal tonight you would, you would imagine after the, the week he's had in the headlines uh, we have only a few minutes left lads we might just get back into the game just briefly before before we finish like, just looking at Azerbaijan's home record here not good Like they lost 3-0 at home to Portugal 2-1 at home to Serbia they're not necessarily bad results uh, but pushed them close 0-0 Montenegro 0-0 Cyprus beaten at home by Luxembourg this is all in the last couple of years in the last 22 games they haven't scored more than a goal a game uh, They're going to be saying the same about us. Though. Well, this is it. Well, Kevin's Kevin's mentioned the clean sheet. Like, the, it, it's probably not been spoken about that much. And the goals he didn't mention the, the the set piece that we conceded against Serbia, which I thought wasn't great either. To be fair, yeah. we we have to not concede today, Kevin. As well, that's the other thing. We just you go there, you get a clean sheet, and then you win the game. Yeah, the was you know I know it sounds quite boring, but what's the worst can happen with a clean sheet? You know, you get a point away from home. Um, it's just that mentality. I would like Stephen to be coming to be say, hearing him say in, in public and putting a bit of pressure on the players, you know, making them think it's not all right to be giving away silly goals, to be not closing down players when you're going to have a shot, to be letting easy crosses come into the box. It's it's all right being brave on the ball and passing out and having a lovely side of football, being brave off the ball as well, and you know, going that extra yard, being focused, being you know, someone leadership, Shane Duffy shouting at one of the players to close down, stop a shot, stop a cross, you know, all the basics of football. We ha- we're actually doing the hard stuff. We're playing nice football. We're not doing the hard stuff of putting it in the net, and we're not doing the, you know, the the what comes more naturally tired over the year has been defensively solid and keeping clean sheets. We're not we're not doing that in the last year. So um, the hard stuff has been brave and trying to play out from the back, and we've been doing that and looking attractive, nice style of football at times. Just tonight, get some of the real basics right. Get it, get a clean sheet, and then hope, as Johnny's been saying, hope one of the strikers especially. Can nick a goal and get get that side of, the, of our game. Yeah, absolutely. Like we had Damien Delaney on the on the show, one of the shows on off the ball here during the week, and he was saying like this Azerbaijan team are technically quite good. They will have long periods of possession, as we saw in the, the first game, but it will be in their own half if you press them. And Stephen Kenny made this point as well. Press them, you can win it back off them quite easily. Like, is there an argument for us being a little bit more direct in this game? I mean, 
we've we've spoken about it before. We need to possibly score the first goal in this game because we did so against against Portugal. Still lost the game, but at least it made something out of it. Like if if we concede first, like we did against um, Azerbaijan last time out, it's really really going to put the pressure on. Yeah, listen, away from home, you naturally. <sighs> I don't want us going direct. No, I, I, like I would like us to play quicker, take free kicks quicker, take throw-ins quicker, do stuff faster. Try catch them. Don't let them get organised. Like they've got an Italian manager. You look through his um, the back, the Biassi, I think his name is. You look through his history. He's like he's a defensively organised manager, and he likes his team to be solid. Well, the way around that is to do things quick, do things fast, do things off the cuff a bit. Not be so structured and so set up and. Uh, you know, a particular person has to take a throw in or a particular person has to take a free kick. Do it quickly. Try to break things down. Without the creative players that we have, we have to do things like that. You know, don't give them a chance to breathe. They, they, they didn't look the most mobile team to me. And you're right, when we pressed them, they didn't look... They had lots of possession in their own half. And when we did press them, and we stopped doing it for whatever reason, and the manager said the lads ran out of legs, well, they didn't look that great. So... Their goal, don't forget their goal as well against us. They didn't look like scoring too many things. Their goal was an absolute mm. wonder strike as well. It was about 30 yards top corner and we didn't close them down. It was a simple thing that we didn't close down. But you don't expect, not too many times he's going to hit that again, it goes in top corner. So there is reasons to be positive going into this game. Um, but we just, a lot of little details we need to get right and the manager needs a bit of luck. And, and some of those strikers need a bit of luck. One of the forwards to break that. Adam, I'd love Adam to be Adam either, you know, he has got a lot of good aspects to his game. Um, love to see him have a few more attempts on goal tonight. I just love it to be that game where this is the this is this, this is the one. This is year zero. Like it starts from here, where Ireland win two or three nil. Um, the, the the strikers score. They look really dangerous. Everyone enjoys it. The Luxembourg game then is kind of that's parked for the time being. We know we're not going to qualify, but this was the game where the Stephen Kenny project really took off. That's that's yeah. the hope and aspiration for sure. Well, uh, Johnny said two nil earlier. I said two nil as well, Kevin and uh, Stephen O'Donnell said two nil as well. So are you, are you going to disagree with us? What what direction are you heading? We'll just get your your quick score prediction tonight. Um, um, I'm going to go for an away win, clean sheet, 1-0, Adamita. We take it, we take it, Adamita on the score sheet. Uh, listen, yeah. Kevin, it's been, uh, it's been great chatting to you this afternoon, uh, really good to get your insight ahead of this match, and listen, sit back and enjoy it, hopefully we'll all sit back and enjoy it now and get the result that we want, but uh, appreciate you taking the call this afternoon. Cheers, that's good talking to you. Great stuff, Kevin Doyle there, the uh, former Republic of Ireland international striker, of course, Johnny Ward. It's been a pleasure this afternoon. I know you're back in tomorrow in studio with uh, Joe Malloy in this uh, this very seat. So yeah, don't uh, please don't let it not be another Sunday of like you know just <laughs> just reading the papers, reading about reading, reading the papers about um, the Stephen Kenny project. Let's just you know it's a lot easier when when we win. Sport might be trivial, but just make our lives that bit easier and just win the bloody game. Yeah, can't wait, can't wait. Listen, it's it's a uh, yeah, it's certainly going to dictate our moods for the rest of the night. And There's a lot of dictates in today. Dictators, dictates, dictators. dictators. Yeah, yeah, there yeah we absolutely. Go. I'll be sitting in a pub in Monaghan Town, no doubt, this evening, either absolutely delighted or uh, in a little state of um, panic and uh, fear for Stephen Kenny's position. I think so. Where we'll is see. it? Where is it? The squealing pig. Squealing pig. That's the very place I'll be. Terry's Bar is another popular haunt of mine. Uh, so go hopefully, get a free pint in each now for mentioning yeah. your names. Yeah. Who knows? Keep keep going there. It's, I'm sure there are other bars that'll give you. Free there are pint. other bars available. You know, yeah. there are. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, it's been an absolute pleasure, Johnny. Let's hope we see the teams lining up. Uh, uh, but Gavin Bazunu, no fear in his eyes. Of course, we know he's he's ready for these occasions. Um, absolutely ready for these occasions. It's a five o'clock kickoff in in Baku, Azerbaijan versus the Republic of Ireland. Um, I've been Shane Hannan sitting in for John Duggan this evening, and uh, we'll have loads of reaction as uh, I mentioned there. Johnny Ward will be in studio with Joe Malloy tomorrow on the show on Off the Ball. We'll have reaction from Brian Kerr as well, and Kenny Cunningham will join the lads in studio uh, for some more reaction as well. The paper review is Rory O'Connor and Tommy Conlon. Coming through the back pages, hopefully they're happy back pages as well after tonight's result. Uh, some rugby as well on tomorrow's show as well. Fiona Hayes will be on. Um, and uh, Andy Friend, the Connacht head coach, will join Joe as well. Really good interview with Brendan Doyle, the uh, Irish skeleton racer as well. Some fascinating uh, stories from him and it talks about his mental health battles. And Conor McKenna, the Tyrone player, an interview from the Gaelic football pod. So uh, listen, really appreciate you taking uh, the time to listen in to us this evening. Get all the podcasts on the OTB Sports app. You'll watch us back on youtube.com forward slash off the ball. But we'll speak to you tomorrow from one o'clock. Have a good one.